This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking the link in the description. The infamous K-1 visa is in the spotlight thanks to the mega popular show The 90 Day Fiancé, and its apparently never-ending number of spin-offs like The 90 Day Fiancé The Other Way, Happily Ever After, Before the 90 Days, 90 Days of Facebook Chats, Say Yes to the 90 Days, We Found Love Thanks to Google Translate, and The 4-Hour Work Fiancé. Leave it to TLC to turn a complicated immigration process into a hit reality show. The premise of the 90 Day Fiancé is that an American citizen falls in love with someone from another country. Once the couple is engaged, U.S. immigration law allows the fiancé to enter the country legally. The process for this is known as the non-immigrant visa, also referred to it by its formal name, the K-1 visa. Obviously, Americans can't get enough of international relationships. In this video, though, we're going to be talking about love, marriage, and international travel, and the legality of the 90 Day Fiancé's K-1 visa. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer, because even crappy reality TV shows implicate complex legal issues. The Fiancé Non-Immigrant Visa is the document an American citizen needs to bring his or her foreign fiancé to the United States. The K-1 visa permits the foreign citizen fiancé to travel to the United States and marry his or her U.S. citizen sponsor within 90 days of arrival. Once married, the foreign citizen will then apply for adjustment of status to lawful permanent resident, can stay in the United States as long as they like. Who can get the K-1 visa? Well, the first requirement is that the U.S. citizen and fiancé must be legally allowed to marry at the time of the petition for the K-1 visa was filed. Marriage laws differ, of course, from country to country and state to state. So to get a K-1 visa, the marriage has to be legally possible according to the laws of the United States uh, and the state in which the marriage will take place. Now, the second requirement is that the couple must have actually met in person. 90 Day Fiancé fans often ask whether the government cares at all about how much time these people spend with each other before applying for the K-1 and coming to the United States. The answer is that generally, the foreign citizen fiancé and the U.S. citizen sponsor must have actually met in person at least once within the past two years. It's probably not too much to ask when you think about it. Although the U.S. government can grant an exception to this requirement for extreme hardship, it is extremely rare for this requirement to be waived. We have seen lots of examples of people not knowing each other for very long before applying for the fiancé visa on the show. Robert, from the most recent season of of the 90 Day Fiancé probably takes the cake. He met his Dominican fiancé, Annie, on Facebook and then scheduled a cruise to meet her in person. And she's hot. Robert then left the cruise for a trip and spent a whopping eight hours with her before deciding that this Cardi B lookalike was his dream woman. For people who think this is crazy, I say, what the hell? Mind your business. I guess it was love at first ship. Their meeting took slightly less time than it takes to register a new car at the DMV, but guess what? Robert and Annie's quick trip met the bare minimum requirement for the K-1 visa. And there have been several couples who use mobile phone apps to communicate with each other because neither speaks the other person's language. Fala sobre o nosso futuro. I want to talk about our future. But I think we can all agree that love is the universal language. So how does one apply for a K-1 visa? Well, the application process is long and it can be very arduous. You need a lot of paperwork to get the ball rolling, including an online uh, non-immigrant visa application, plus additional forms if the person has children, a passport, a birth certificate, divorce certificates if applicable, police certificates from everywhere the fiance has lived since the age of 16, medical examinations, photographs, evidence of the relationship, and payment of fees. And there's just one one more thing, evidence of financial support. This is actually a pretty big deal. U.S. politicians frequently make claims about the immigration process and that they worry that people who come to the United States will be a financial burden on the country. But to some extent, immigration laws already have strict requirements about financial responsibility when you come to the United States. During their visa interview, applicants must produce evidence to the consular office that they will not become a public charge in the United States. Public charge refers to being unable to provide basic necessities of living like housing, food, shelter, and clothing. If a person will become a public charge, the visa will be denied and that person cannot enter the country. Now, the evidence of financial support could be information showing the person can financially support themselves. For instance, if the person has a job lined up or has a lucrative career as a model, 
or they just happen to be incredibly rich. Since this is likely not the case for most people, they must be able to show that the US citizen can provide financial support. The American citizen will have to file an affidavit stating that he or she will be able to support their new spouse and any children who come over with that new fiance. This is a legally binding contract. If the person the citizen is sponsoring becomes a public charge and the government has to provide public services, the agency providing the help can sue the American citizen to recover the costs. So how does the US government decide whether someone will become a public charge? There are many factors, a person's age, education, work experience, skills, assets, financial resources, and health, they're all taken into account. And we've seen how the allegation of a public charge possibility has impacted the somewhat happy couples. When Nicole, a single mother who struggles to make ends meet, fell in love with a man from Morocco, she knew she would be unable to meet the financial requirements for the K-1 visa. But her father decided to co-sponsor Azan and the government gave him a visa. I mean, he sounded sincere. He sounded like he wants to be with Nicole. He's a good guy and you guys will see that when you get to meet him. Paul has appeared on two seasons of 90 Day Fiance. Paul is a Kentucky man in his late 30s who fell in love with a Brazilian woman named Corrine. Are you excited to meet me? Are you excited I'm coming to Brazil? I no. don't understand. Oh no, she doesn't understand, that's not good. Despite their age difference, 12 years and language problems, neither speak the other person's language, they fell in love. Paul and Corrine first appeared on Before the 90 Days, which chronicled Paul's efforts to bring Corrine to the United States. Paul inquired about bringing Corrine to America on a K-1 visa, but he ran into trouble because he's a grown-ass man living with his parents, who doesn't really work. I'm definitely a mama's boy, I will say that. Oh, I love you. I know. <laughs> love you too, Paul. <laughs> Financial affidavit requires proof of income, three years of tax returns, bank statements, employee verification, and lots of other stuff that Paul didn't have. And Paul's mom wasn't about to sign the papers necessary to support Corrine. I think it's all crazy myself, really. When Corrine got pregnant, the couple then appeared on 90 Day the Other Way, where Paul decided to go live in Corrine's very remote Brazilian hometown. The hapless Paul's exploits in Brazil included worrying about whether deadly fish would be able to swim up his urethra and carrying a mosquito net with him everywhere. Better to have it and not need it than need it than not have it. The relationship might not have worked, but it made for some fantastic television. Chickens. <laughs> now, one of the highlights of his storyline was Paul running into the jungle after the government of Brazil denied him the right to live permanently in the country of Brazil. The reason? Paul has a felony conviction for arson. The second case, my ex-girlfriend and I both took out restraining orders against each other. Just a quality human being. And as you can see, other countries also have immigration standards. But love conquers all. So that left the couple back where they started, trying to assure the US government that Paul can financially support his family if they come to the United States. Now that Paul's mom has grandchildren, she may be more willing to sign that financial affidavit. I'm told you should definitely stay tuned. Now, 90 Day fans are always on the lookout for people abusing the fiance application process. Is this true love or just a foreigner looking for a green card? Is the American citizen sketchy and dangling the visa as leverage to control their foreign fiance? Well, Congress has long been concerned about the possibility of abuse and fraud and exploitation from both the US citizen and the foreign fiance. In 2005, Congress enacted the International Marriage Broker Regulation Act to reduce abuse of marriage-based visa recipients. The law adds a few safeguards to the screening process that are intended to protect both the visa applicant and the US petitioner. For example, if the American petitioner used a foreign marriage broker, which are the companies that are often referred to as mail order bride companies, they have to disclose it to the US government and the broker must meet certain strict requirements. Not as strict as building new housing in San Francisco, but still, kind of onerous. All US petitioners must undergo a background check and the results must be shared with the immigrant fiance. This helps protect a foreign fiance from arriving in the United States to discover that the American fiance is a criminal. And they say, I can't come, you crazy old man, I don't have green card. And they say, screw green cards, they're for poor people, just get over here. US law also mandates that if a petitioner has committed specific violent or sex crimes, they cannot petition for a K-1 visa. These are crimes like homicide, stalking, assault, domestic violence, kidnapping, and human trafficking. And what about if the foreign fiance has a criminal record? Well, if the fiance has a criminal record, in most cases, the person will be ineligible for the visa or to enter the United States
points at all. This is even true when the person's crimes have been expunged. Even misdemeanor convictions can make a person ineligible. These crimes are listed in section 212 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. They include crimes of moral turpitude, a violation of any drug law, US or foreign, any kind of drug trafficking, even if it doesn't result in a conviction, prostitution or participating in prostitution in any way, participating in human trafficking, whether directly or indirectly, and money laundering. Now, there are some exceptions to the rules. A person may apply for a waiver of a drug offense if it was a single offense of simple possession of marijuana, and if the conviction was over 15 years old before applying for the visa. But the US has to be satisfied that the person was rehabilitated. The person seeking the waiver also has to show that admission to the US would not be contrary to the national welfare, safety, or security of the United States. If your overseas fiance was convicted of only one crime and the maximum penalty possible for that crime is less than one year, he or she might not need the waiver of inadmissibility. This exception does not take into account the actual sentence length given to the person, but rather the maximum penalty that could have been given as a result of the crime. The sentencing exception does not apply, however, to drug crimes. Now, the 90 Day Fiance has several different couples impacted by one person's criminal history. Let's take a look at the situation for Tiffany and Ronald from 90 Day the Other Way. Tiffany is an American who went to South Africa and fell in love with Ronald. Ronald turned out to have a pretty serious history of gambling. I was at my rock bottom. I had a full-blown addiction of gambling. He has been charged with armed robbery, theft, and possession of drugs during a traffic stop. And Ronald's addiction was so bad that he wound up selling off his mother's kitchen appliances, got arrested, and the adjudication was delayed so he could attend rehab. Tiffany, who wasn't even fully aware of the full extent of Ronald's issues, moved with her son, Daniel, to South Africa. Once she learned the truth, she decided to marry Ronald anyway, and the two tied the knot just days after he moved out of rehab. When Tiffany got pregnant, she decided she couldn't stand living in South Africa, so she returned to the US. Now, where does this leave Ronald, her drug and gambling addicted husband? His record's a little funky. There's quite a bit on there. Well, at the most recent tell-all, Tiffany announced that she is starting the process to bring Ronald to the US on a spousal visa. When she discussed this with a lawyer on an earlier episode, the lawyer explained that Ronald's arrest history would be problematic for him to come to the United States, even without an actual conviction. If there's anywhere in his record that he admitted it, that is an admission for which he can be determined inadmissible. Tiffany, however, feels confident that this history won't matter because she erroneously believes that love is stronger than lawyers. But in this particular instance, Tiffany might be right. Violations of gambling laws are not generally considered crimes of moral turpitude. Ronald's other charges could present problems, however, especially the drug charge. The US CIS will have to review the full extent of his South African arrests before they decide if he can come to the United States. Now, the show also includes couples who are already married. People who married a foreign spouse can apply for a CR1 visa to allow them to immigrate to America. People who apply for the CR1 must satisfy most of the same requirements as the K1 visa, including a clean criminal record and proving that they have financial support. Now, traditionally, it was easy to bring a foreign born spouse to America. However, that has changed in recent years, largely due to the Trump administration's travel ban. The travel ban restricts immigration from countries deemed dangerous, including Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Korea, Yemen, North Korea, and uh, Venezuela. We've already seen how this plays out in the show. A 19-year-old Avery was a self-described party girl from Columbus, Ohio, until she met Omar, a Syrian, online. The two fell in love and she converted to Islam. And Avery married Omar on a trip to Lebanon. This means she didn't need to apply for a K-1 fiance visa. And although Avery's mother kinda, sorta supports the relationship, Oh my gosh. She is highly uncomfortable with the idea of her daughter moving to Syria to live with Omar, even though he insists that this part of Syria is pretty safe. The whole country is in the middle of civil war, Avery. I personally think you're worrying too much. Eventually, the couple decided that the best thing would be for Omar to come to the US, so they applied for the CR1 visa, which is for an immigrant spouse. Unfortunately for the couple, the travel ban restricts the number of Syrians who can enter the US, even if they are married to an American citizen. The lawyer has worked on, he said, many travel ban cases, and none of them have been approved. 
A CR1 visa is supposed to be easy to obtain, but the Supreme Court okayed the travel ban, in part because the Trump administration said it would grant waivers if a couple experienced undue hardship and the foreign spouse was basically not a terrorist. In practice, though, the waiver has been harder to obtain. The Trump administration has been vague about what constitutes an undue hardship. According to the Trump administration, fewer than 5% of people who applied for waivers have been approved. And of this 5% who were approved, the government is in no rush to provide the visa. Over one third of those who have been approved are still awaiting the visa. That's why some are finding their spouse in administrative limbo. Instead of being denied, the, the case is placed in administrative processing where it may sit for many years. And although Avery and Omar have indicated that Omar's application was accepted, that just means the government is reviewing the petition to enter the country. As a lawyer explained to Avery, Omar is going to need that waiver if he has any hope of getting into the United States. Now, admittedly, lots of 90 Day fans are claiming that TLC told that lawyer to lie about Omar's hopes of getting into the United States. But the lawyer is probably right here. As the form shows, Omar's petition has been accepted for processing, but it says right on the bottom of the form that it is not a visa it will still be an uphill battle for him to be admitted. Now, there are limitations on the K-1 visa. A person who enters the U.S. has 90 days to marry a U.S. citizen, but only that particular U.S. citizen. If a guy like Sinjin from the new season of 90 Days decides that Tanya is not really his cup of tea and he'd rather marry another American, he will have to leave the country and start the whole process all over again. And it looks like American citizen Rebecca from before the 90 days is on her second K-1 visa. Rebecca was in the middle of a divorce from her Moroccan-born husband when she met Zaid, a 26-year-old from Tunisia. Oh my God, I love you so much. I love you more. He's amazing. Rebecca, who is a private investigator, has now applied for the K-1 visa for Zaid. And she better make this one count, since a U.S. citizen is limited to two K-1 visas during their entire lifetime. This limitation protects foreign fiancés from exploitation. Because if a U.S. citizen could apply for K-1 visas whenever they felt like it, they could lure people into the country with false promises of marriage and then subject that person to involuntary servitude or, or worse. And although Rebecca's Moroccan ex hasn't appeared on the show, his legal status could be up in the air because of their divorce. The immigration fraud amendments of 1986 make the foreign spouse's permanent residency conditional for two years. This means that the couples must remain married for two years for the visa to stick. If the couple splits up, then the government may revoke the immigrant spouse's permanent residency status. This means that the person is in the country unlawfully and has to leave. Of course, there are lots of procedural hurdles that can trip up a visa application. On the brand new season of 90 Day Fiancé, we met Michael and Juliana. Michael is a 42-year-old, quote, wine entrepreneur. Mm. And Juliana is a 23-year-old Brazilian model. When they met at a yacht party in Croatia, when Juliana was about 19 years old, it was love at first sight, uh, again. I don't necessarily believe in love at first sight, but it's like we were kindred spirits. Although Michael flew around the world with Juliana, she was repeatedly denied a US visitor visa. The reason? Her age and history were red flags for prostitution. The US government can deny entry to any person who it suspects is coming to the United States solely, principally, or incidentally to engage in prostitution, or has engaged in prostitution within 10 years of the date of the application for a visa, admission, or adjustment of status. Juliana and Michael vehemently deny that Juliana was ever an escort or a yacht girl. Michael stresses that Juliana was just a beautiful girl from a very poor village in Brazil who found love in a not so hopeless place, a yacht full of rich people. Certainly a lot of people that may pass judgment may think I'm just an old sleazy rich guy going after a young hot woman. It doesn't bother me at all. But not surprisingly, these are the very things that the government considers red flags. You don't need to be convicted of prostitution to be denied entry. In practice, the government is looking carefully at people who are working in the tourism or entertainment industries. Sometimes there's a very fine line between being a model and being a model who is also paid to entertain clients on a boat, for example. Um, let's talk about you. Uh, what do you do for a living? Model. A model? What kind of model? A fashion model. 
The government is also actively screening for victims of human trafficking. Although Juliana and Michael protest the questions over their motives, teen girls from Brazil and Thailand are often lured into dangerous situations by men promising lucrative modeling opportunities. And unfortunately, escort jobs can sometimes be the gateway or the price of admission to working in entertainment and tourism. Of course, Michael claims that he has already invested more than $150,000 in his relationship with Juliana. There didn't seem to be much due process, Michael whined in the second episode, which focused on Juliana's interview with the U.S. immigration authorities. Michael and Juliana have a lawyer, so I'm willing to bet that they were well aware that this question would continue to pop up. But don't take my word for it. Just look at this form, the I-485 application for the K-1 visa. As you can see, question 35, 36, 37, and 38 all concern allegations of prostitution. And despite the probing questions, eventually the government decided that Juliana had not in fact been involved in illicit activities. Now, many 90-day fans have questions about another potential legal hurdle to the K-1 visa, immigrants from countries where polygamy is legal. So let's see how this plays out, thanks to the ever-popular couple, Michael and Angela. Angela was a divorced grandmother of six when she met Michael, a Trump-loving 30-year-old Nigerian man, online. Oh, son. Angela's first visit to Nigeria was featured on Before the 90 Days. She was going to propose to Michael, but then she discovered that he committed some, let's say, unusual sexual indiscretions at a nightclub. But the relationship was off. Or was it? The two spent the rest of the season fighting. Angela accused Michael of taking from her bank account without authorization and broke off the engagement. Later, Angela figured out it was a banking error and Michael was back in. But on the next season, Angela and Michael renewed their engagement. They have applied for a K-1 visa, but there may be trouble ahead. The 58-year-old grandmother has promised Michael and his mom that she will have his baby as soon as possible. A fertility doctor said Angela is down to her very last egg. So Angela hit up her daughter for a fresh one. Angela's daughter has repeatedly refused to give her mother an egg. So Michael has proposed having a baby with another woman. And in certain areas of Nigeria, polygamy is in fact legal. Which brings us to the question, what happens if polygamy is legal in a foreign country? Could Michael bring another Nigerian spouse into the country on a K-1 visa and then live happily ever after with Angela and the other wife? Well, the answer is no. Although TLC would dearly love to have a reality show called My Big Fat Polygamous Fiancés, Polygamy is illegal in the United States and a person cannot immigrate or become a naturalized US citizen if they practice polygamy. Angela and Michael will need to resort to plan B. If anyone has a free egg, remember, she can tote it. She just needs the egg. I can tote it, I just need your egg. Of course, the most important requirement for a K-1 visa is something you won't find in the US code. What all of these 90 day fiancés have in common is that they are all Instagram experts. It's pretty much a requirement for entry to the US these days. Now, if you want to be a 90 day fiance or at least raise your Instagram game, I'd highly recommend Brandon Wolfel's Skillshare class, Instagram worthy photography, shoot, edit, and share. You can go behind the scenes as Brandon shares his full process for capturing one of a kind portraits and action shots. Every step is packed with helpful tips and unexpected hacks developed over Brandon's journey from teaching himself photography in his bedroom to inspiring over 3 million followers on Instagram. Skillshare is an online learning community that has thousands of classes on everything like lifestyle, music, design, technology, and business. It's great for Brazilian fiancés who just want to come to the US and party on boats. A yearly membership is less than $10 per month, but Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click on the link below. Plus, it really helps out the channel, so just click on the link below. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must-know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things, all free for two months. So make 2020 the year that you explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in your creativity with Skillshare's online classes. Do you agree? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other Real Law reviews over here where I talk about whistleblowers, hearsay objections, and the impeachment inquiry, tons and tons of other legal breaking news. And as always, I'll see you in court.